What does it mean if your child's eyes look white in a flash photograph? It could be a retinoblastoma. In this episode of OcuTalk, optometrist Rhonda Jabri explains what retinoblastoma is, how to detect it, the treatment options available, and what the recovery process looks like. Dr. Jabri? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OcuTalk. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jabri, who is with Synoptic Eye Care out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Dr. Jabri, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, doing fantastic. Doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, you know, we always like to start at the top of these interviews by just getting a little bit of your background and specialty. So tell us about what got you into optometry. Um, the, getting into optometry was actually a late discovery for me late in, um, undergrad. I didn't really know what I was going to do. So, um, one of my close friends at the time was looking into optometry and it's funny that she didn't end up doing it, but she influenced my decision to get into optometry. Um, so I shadowed a couple of doctors and I knew it was it right from the beginning, shadowing at a private practice. I knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, I like that it was a stress-free environment. I loved the relationship the doctors had with their patients, and and I knew right off the bat that that's what I wanted to do. So uh, that's what got me into optometry. Well, very good. Well, we're happy to have you today. And today we're going to be talking about retinoblastoma. Uh, so let's start at the very top of this uh, by just what is a retinoblastoma? So retinoblastoma is actually the uh, most common eye cancer in children. And the word retinoblastoma comes from retinoblast, which is the name of the retinal cells that, um, that's the name of the retinal cells before development, before we're born. Um, so retinoblastoma is when the, um, when a gene called RB1 is mutated. So this gene normally signals to the retinoblasts to stop growing once they've reached a certain level of maturity where they're supposed to be. So when, when that gene, the RB1 gene is mutated, it, that signal never really happens. It never gets out to the cells. So they never stop growing and they continuously uh, multiply and cause a tumor in the eye um, or multiple tumors, depending on the type of cancer they, they get. So is this uh, strictly hereditary or is this something that, that uh, can be acquired? Um, so it's actually, um, it can be hereditary, but that brings us to the two different types of retinoblastoma. Uh, there's the congenital type or also known as hereditary, and then there's a sporadic or non-hereditary type of retinoblastoma. So it certainly can be hereditary. So um, hereditary is obvious where that comes from. Is there a particular cause uh, for the non-hereditary? Um, not that we know of. So with the um, congenital type of the hereditary, um, those children are born with that gene mutation in every single retinal cell and actually every single cell of their body. Um, so they're, bo they're born with it. So they're more likely to develop um, diff multiple tumors and they're more likely to get it in both eyes. But with a sporadic type, we don't really know what causes that spontaneous mutation to happen. It's just a random a mutation that happens in one retinal cell in one of their eyes. So those children are less likely to have it multiple times or have multiple tumors in both of their eyes. So uh, let's talk about that for a second, uh, because I actually have somebody in my personal life that's had a retinoblastoma and they, they have a prosthetic now because they had to have their eye uh, removed. Is, is it typical that it's in both eyes? Uh, I know you talked about it being more prevalent, certainly in cases in the hereditary case, but is it common that it's in both eyes? Is it more common that it's in one eye? It's actually more common to get it in one eye than uh, in both eyes. So the hereditary is only uh, comprises only one third of retinoblastoma cases. And then out of the hereditary or congenital type of retinoblastoma, it's less likely to have it in both eyes, although um, you can have it in one eye and then multiple years later it can show up in the other eye, but it's more prevalent to just have it in one eye unilaterally. So does it, is it primarily that this is being diagnosed and treated in children or are, are there adults that, that uh, can be treated for this as well? So it is a childhood cancer. It's very, very 
rare. I don't think I've heard of, of a case where um, an adult has been diagnosed with it unless it's it's diagnosed very later in 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 late childhood, really, or later in life. So what? Let's talk about the diagnosis. Um, so if if I were a parent, obviously, if if you have a, a history of this in your family, uh, I guess let's start there. How strong is that gene? Right? Like if let's say if somebody in my family already had a retinoblastoma, what are my chances of having the same thing? I don't know an exact percentage, but there the risk is there. Um, it's obviously if anybody has that gene in their family or really any history of any cancers. It doesn't have to be retinal blastoma in specific. That just means your children are more likely to get cancer. So you're, you should watch them closely. Um, but the diagnosis usually happens early in life, usually through a uh, photo that is taken with flash. Um, so the parents or family members will notice that one of the kids' pupils is white, and the term for that is leukocoria. So if you um, if you um, notice that usually we have a normal red reflex in our pupils when we take a flash photo, they'll notice that one eye is a white pupil, the other one is a red pupil, um, or both of them in some cases are white pupils, and that's what prompts parents to bring their kids in to get examined. Um, because it's really hard for a two or three year old to come up to their parent and say, I have poor vision out of this eye, the, the child does not know any better. Um, and that's really, um, it's parents paying attention to these things, or just making sure they bring their kids in for eye exams as early as six months, really, to um, have that early diagnosis, the earlier the diagnosis, the better the prognosis. Yeah. So what you're describing, and that's very interesting. I, I'd never heard that before. Um, you know, so you're talking about, you know, we're used to when you take the picture, everybody's eyes are red. And you're saying that in some cases, some people's won't be red and it'll be more of a whitish color. That's Correct. Yes. And it's um, it's funny um, because now a lot more people are I've seen people post on the Internet um diagnosing their pet with cataracts or certain tumors in the eye because their dog will have a white pupil in the, in the, one of the pictures. Um, so the awareness is is spreading and it's not just for, for kids. It could be for your pet too. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, yeah, that is very interesting. Uh, well, I guess nowadays people take so many more pictures than in, ever before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when you had those uh, disposable cameras and you're like, I have to really figure out what I want these 20 pictures to be. And now like you take pictures of your shoe or something <laughs> yeah you have 50 of 50 pictures of the same same thing basically oh yeah yeah like now yeah that's the default let's take four of them right <laughs> so let's let's go back into uh diagnosis here right so we, we talked about there there are some um anecdotal evidence like we talked about with the with the the pictures here but is there any other indication other than an eye exam that you could get to to know whether or not you have a retinoblastoma yeah, so besides the white pupil in the photos, that's kind of like hallmark sign. Um, another sign is misalignment of the eyes or strabismus. So if you notice that your kid's eye, one of the eyes is turned out or in and not aligned with the other eye, that, that could actually be a sign of an eye cancer or in some cases, um, some congenital cataracts as well. And the reason why that eye turns out or in um, and is not aligned with the other is because that eye is not getting a clear image. It's not, the brain is not using the image from that eye. So it kind of um, becomes neglected by the brain. Right. So it's not really focused or is in alignment with the other eye. Um, so that's another sign. Um, another one is um, poor vision, especially if the cancer is in both eyes. Um, you'll notice the kid is not is missing things because of the vision or maybe bumping into things or or anything like that. So but again, it's hard for the kid to come forward and say, I can't see out of this eye because kids don't know any better. They think that's just the way the world is. You know, and we've talked about this so many times on the channel. And if we may soapbox for a second to uh, to talk about a, a public service announcement, a lot of people will think, "Why do I need to take uh, a child so young to the eye doctor?" Right? Because uh, as you just saw, they wouldn't know if their vision was bad, anyways. Right? And it's not like they're reading books or anything like that. Why does it matter? Well, the reason it matters is for reasons like this. Right? That there are some things that uh, you're not gonna be able to see without going to an eye doctor. And there are very real eye diseases that 
typically occur in younger ages. And if they are dealt with at young ages, there are things that can be done, better right? Better outcomes. Exactly. So it's just really important to take a look. And, and, and for the viewers out there, I get it, right? Like, yes, they're not reading books. They're not going through that. But there are very real medical issues that you want to look at the same way that you would get a checkup on anything else. Certainly, of course. So let's let's switch gears here a little bit. We've talked about how we can diagnose this. Uh, how how do we treat it? Uh, obviously, there's probably varying treatments depending on the severity. But let's talk about some of those now. Let's say we've come in, we we have diagnosed, and we've determined that there is the presence of uh, of some degree of retinoblastoma. What do we do next? Right. So uh, upon diagnosis, it's really important to have the child undergo genetic testing to see if they have that RB1 gene, because that assesses the risk. That tells us, should we watch out for it in the other eye? Is this child more likely to develop other types of cancer uh, in the future? Because those kids are more likely to develop other cancers. Um, so genetic uh, testing is really important. Um, the second thing, the child will be uh, managed by a pediatric oncologist or specialist. And there's different types of treatment, like you said, depending on the size, the location, the stage of cancer that they have. Um, so for the smaller, more localized tumors, um, they tend to use uh, cryotherapy or thermotherapy. So cryotherapy freezes those cancer cells. Thermotherapy uses um, heat energy to kill off the uh, cancer cells. And, and sometimes uh, the thermotherapy is used in conjunction with chemotherapy. And chemotherapy, just like any other cancer, can be uh, localized or systemic depending if that tumor has spread into the brain or surrounding tissue, or if the child has other types of cancer at the same time, um, the localized chemotherapy can be uh, administered through an intravitreal injection in the eye, or it could be a local infusion into the central retinal artery, again, depending on the size and location of the tumor and just the stage of the cancer's cancer that they're at. But the most extreme and the saddest treatment would be the enucleation or removal of the eye. Um, and again, that is that entails uh, removing the eye and removing part of the optic nerve as well. In some cases where the cancer has spread to the uh, surrounding orbital tissue, it could actually mean removal of that as well. And that changes what type of prosthetic the child is is uh, fitted into after that. So treatment really depends on a lot of things, but those are some of the treatments. So does it matter, um, does the, the level of treatment, right? Like obviously we talked about the most extreme, right? The most extreme, as you said, is removal of the eye. It, it does the um, does how early we catch this have any bearing on whether or not we have to go to those extreme measures? Of course, yes. Um, the earlier, the better, because the tumor only grows in size. So the the earlier you catch it, the smaller it is the more likely you are to save the patient's vision, patient's eye, and even their life, because the earlier you catch it, the less likely it is to spread to other parts of the body and to the brain also. Oh, well, absolutely. And I think in modern times, it's sort of common sense when it comes to uh, cancers of any form, right? Um, but well, let's talk about that. So we talked about the treatment, but what is what does recovery look like? Now, obviously, again, it depends, right, is the answer on uh, what treatment we have. But let's talk about the varying degrees uh, that we might have to, to deal with in terms of recovering from the surgery uh, yeah. or, or, or lack thereof, right? Let's say not surgery, let's say the treatment. Right. Um, so recovery, usually the first step is um, to fit the patient into a prosthetic once that heals, if they had their eye removed, if they underwent chemotherapy or radiation. Um, some of these kids will have some vision problems, um, some hearing problems sometimes from the radiation. Depending on how young the patient is, the bone structure or if they had their eye removed um, is going to be impacted as they grow older because that having that type of traumatic experience is going to affect their facial features somewhat. Um, and we can't forget about um, the psychological aspect of this. So this, this is really affecting the child's quality of life. 
um, because they're in and out of the doctor a lot, um, especially if they're at risk of developing other cancers, they really have to be monitored closely. And uh, the close monitoring goes for either the sporadic or the congenital form of that. So um, those are some of the effects. So we've, we've gone, we've got diagnosed, we've had some sort of treatment, right? And, uh, and now we've moved on. Is that the case? Can, can I move on from this? What are the chances of it coming back? Uh, and, and if it did come back, what, what, what do I do then? So in sporadic cases, uh, there's actually a very, very low chance of it coming back. So it's 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 unlikely for it to come back. Um, so, But that does not mean those p patients are not monitored. We still want to monitor them closely, but not as close as the ones with the hereditary form, uh, because those are more likely to develop it as well as get other uh, cancers throughout the body. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly it, patients can move on and they can lead a normal life, even if they only have one eye. Um, you only need one eye to be legal to drive um, in, in most states, I think. Um, and they can lead a normal life uh, for the most part and, and not be impacted by that um, as long as they have some vision left, yes. I, ha I have a question here uh, about what happens if it goes undiagnosed, right? But I'm hearing what you're talking about. Is it possible for it to go undiagnosed? Uh, it, it seems like this is something that would be very uh, apparent, right? Uh, it, does it ever go undiagnosed? Um, nowadays, not so much. Um, I imagine in the earlier days, it was possible and it could lead to, to death. The patient could lose their life because cancer just spreads throughout the body. But nowadays, it's it's very hard for, for it to be missed. If, as long as the, the child has care, going to the pediatrician, their, their parents, they're, they're taking care of them. Um, once they start school, their, their teacher has to notice some visual problems if they have them, that. So um, we're very fortunate now that it's, it's very, very unlikely, very rare and unheard of for it to go undiagnosed for forever because somebody has to catch it at some point. Right, right. And ideally, as we said, we'd like to catch it as early as possible to expand our treatment options, right? Um, so again, if we can soapbox, it's always really important to get those, uh, you know, those, those early checkups for the children. So we talked a lot about retinoblastoma today. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, is there anything you think we missed about the topic? Um, one more thing is um, after recovery, I should have talked about this earlier with, uh, with the recovery and moving on, but um, it's important that the kids that have lost an eye for them to wear protective eyewear. Um, full time, even if they don't need prescription glasses, because now they only have one good eye. And if anything, if they're in a sports activity or just really walking around, something could fly into the good eye and they could be left potentially blind and, and not able to navigate through life if something happens to that good eye. So protective eyewear is really important. Protective eyewear is recommended for children in general, um, just for protection purposes, um, but especially these uh, kids that, that only have one eye or, or one good eye. Yeah, absolutely. Statistically, you've increased your chances uh, significantly at that point. Yeah, and most of the time, if something were to fly into your eye, it goes into the good eye. I've seen that with a lot of patients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes. Well, it's the one that you have in focus, right? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Uh, Dr. Jabri, thank you so much. This was such an interesting topic today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, and, and uh, certainly if anybody has any questions in the comments, we'll certainly uh, let people put those in there. Uh, but again, it's really important to get those early diagnosis. Uh, you know, and this is just one more example of, of things that can be found out and can be addressed early on if they are diagnosed. Uh, so outside of that, thank you so much. Uh, this was a really interesting conversation. So thank you for being with us. You're very welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure and I, I really enjoyed talking to you.